So warmly welcome for this uh, Riga Level 3 important training, especially for serving to Saudi Aramco at different projects, including uh, Saudi Electricity and Royal Commission and plenty of other brands are operating in Saudi Arabia. So everywhere, all sort of industries, especially construction, oil and gas, mining, or you just uh, name any industry, the rigging and lifting is quite common process, you know, everywhere we observe. So that's why the no harm to ask the first question, why still accidents are happening? What are the real root causes of accidents and rigging and lifting process? As per your understanding, if you want to participate, otherwise I'll move on. Any of your understanding? Yeah, sure. So just bear in mind, uh, overload is one of the most common causes of rigging system failures, especially not calculating the total load weight before the lift can also cause failure. So what we truly have to do is to make sure that the hook you know, below the hook devices, such as lifting beams or separator bars or wire slings, and the total load, load weight is also calculated. So, like if our crane can lift uh, or is designed for probably 100 tons, so we should never try or we should never cross this line of fire, you know. And even uh, the be best strategy is use the capacity 75% to 85% you know, of your crane capacity instead of uh, uh, going with overload because overload would be a terrible cause of uh, toppling over or tipping over of the crane. Even the swinging, especially if wind speed is also there. So things uh, can go out of control anytime. So in that context, so overload is one of the most common causes of rigging system failures. Right. Now, the, the most uh, important question, because this crane is uh, all the time involved in rigging and lifting. Yeah. Most of the time. So what are the root causes of crane accidents? So as per OSHA, some of the analysis we have there, what they mention is boom or crane contact with energized overhead power lines, especially uh, nearly 45% of the cases the incident happened just because of uh, this crane or boom contact with overhead or energized power lines. Could be underground, could be overhead. So that safe distance from the power line, like if we are operating a crane, how far we should be away from the power lines actually? Uh, do you have any idea or shall I? mention here you know because even though it's not a safety training but still it's important to understand the safety features or kind of safety rules as well yeah please kindly explain it. yeah okay so whenever we are operating near to energized power lines we have to be very much familiar about the voltage actually how much voltage or volts are there within these lines like if zero to fifty thousand volts I repeat again, zero to 50,000 volts. Okay. If that is the case, like, so make sure minimum 10 feet distance is there. That means three meter, zero okay. to 50,000 volts and 50,000 volts to 250,000 volts, if I remember exactly. So you make it double actually, like 20 feet or 6.1 meter another way around. Right. Now, 250,000 to onward, minimum 25 feet or 7.5 meter. Right. And any brand or any customer or any regulatory body, or I would say even the government bodies, what they exactly guiding us, the minimum safety requirements. What they really want us to follow, at least the minimum safety requirements. They are not like expecting 100% accuracy everywhere, but at least they want us to follow the minimum safety requirements. So these are minimum requirements. Right. The rest is our own choice. Like instead of 10 feet distance, even the voltage are uh, maybe 300 volts are there. 
So if you keep 20 feet, you are more safer actually, because you are creating more green zone, you know, for your employees or for your site even. Right. So that is our own choice, by the way, but the standard of course, make us bound to follow some of the safety requirements in return, we can keep our employees safe. Now, another cause of crane accident mentioned under the hook lifting device is very critical. If that condition is not good, of course, uh, things could go out of control. Overturned crane is a quite common phenomenon. The reason is uh, overloading. Sometimes maybe the foundation is not leveled properly. Maybe the outer rigor are not used or maybe the surface capacity, you know, where you are uh, uh, like uh, placing your crane that is not yeah. designed for that uh, weight actually of the crane. Dropped load and boom collapse, crushing by the counterweight or outer rigor use like falls and rigging failure. Untrained or uncertified crane operator. It's not mentioned by OSHA, but I added these two lines like untrained or uncertified crane operators and rigor with poor practical knowledge. Because if he doesn't understand how to uh, what kind of shackles or what kind of slings he has to you, how to calculate the load. If the load is not familiar of the weight, how he has to calculate that load, you know, how the spotter signals, he must be familiar to follow in, how the crane operator must be uh, in better communication with the rigger, with the spotter, and uh, what uh, safety precautions they have to make sure, you know, and if I, uh, like not for rigor level three, but at least for rigor level one, if critical lift pan also need to be prepared, how to prepare it, how to approve it. So plenty of things required, you know, as a rigor, which must be, you know, uh, as a practical uh, uh, performance must be shown by the riggers actually. And even I tell them that you are the front leader in rigging and lifting process, you are the front leader. Even not the safety manager, even not the safety officer. Trust me, the rigor is the front leader, you know, and for that particular process, because all the technicalities, he must understand much, much better than anyone else. You know. Right. So that's why now no harm to dig out. What are the key hazards of rigging process itself? Uh, in later stage, I'll, I'll definitely give you some of the hints, you know, for any process in the world. Uh, I personally divided them into three different stages, like before, during, and after. Any okay. process in the world, before, sure. during, and after, what things matters a lot, what safety rules we need to follow, what formats we need to uh, fill in, and what kind of planning we require, in the before or during and after, whatever, and what key steps we need to follow, you know, to keep our employees safe or to make sure the execution of that particular process is going as per the expectations of our clients, not uh, uh, violating any kind of legal laws even, and meeting our expectations also, because we don't want to see any unwanted incident or kind of accident, right? So these right. are some of the hazards commonly we observe in rigging process, like swinging loads. If you don't use tagline properly, or again, you know, the wind speed is another factor. So the swinging loads is one of the terrible hazard, I would say, because once the load is swing, it's really hard to control it, you know. Yeah. Now, manual handling of heavy rigging, uh, holding on that uh, on to the tagline, moving equipment or pinch points. I hope you understand the pinch points. You know all the corner points of the. Uh, I would say the the boundary of that uh, boundary points of that crane or any point of weight is there attached with the crane. Working on elevated surfaces or trip hazards or slippery surfaces. So these are some of the common hazards and rigging process. Now, how we gonna right. control them? What are the key precautions? There are very lengthy stories, but at least five rules for safe rigging we must bear in our mind. You know, first of all, make sure the qualified workers are doing this job. Don't accept any unqualified or kind of untrained or uncertified person for that one. Even imagine if you as a rigger three working and 
and you are uh, approved like you passed third party exam you passed a ramco theoretical and practical exam as well now you are approved regal level 3 so that mm-hmm. means you are the right person for the right job so everybody has yes. some expectations that under your leadership nothing will go wrong or the probability of the chances of accident will be very less because you are the qualified regal level 3 Right. and even though you are qualified experience having practical sound knowledge but still if your id is expired just yesterday still you are not authorized to carry on your job right yeah. same way if we have a crane operator make sure he is also certified if we have signal man make sure having third party certification and uh, some practical understanding is there and you as a front leader ultimately <laughs> are going to be responsible actually exactly so make sure the equipment and environment is safe so you have to be the keen observer like a, you know uh, sometimes i say the micro level your deep analysis of the environment either there is any unsafe condition or Oh, where exactly you are going to perform this rigging process so what can go wrong even he will think about the invisible enemies maybe some toxic gases can come from you know the other projects of uh, or the neighbor projects are going on so he will think about all the way he will think about the other processes like might be excavation is going on might be some confined spaces are there might be some chemicals are stored nearby might be some you know simultaneous operations are going on so in that context he'll be more careful actually because he is the one to understand more deeper what other equipments are operating and what kind of environment is going to work in either it's a congested environment either it's like uh, uh, you know uh, it's a, it's a right uh, shop floor management on that side or something Uh, terrible which he has to manage even before starting the project now make sure that the load is balanced this is one of the greatest challenge i would say all the riggers are facing especially to achieve like a center of gravity because balance is life so anything unbalanced even i would say 5% unbalanced is all over right either is a hook or there is a load not leveled properly the center of gravity is not achieved so that's why it's important you know uh, how to achieve this center of gravity how to level or balance that load and also using this uh, qualified spotter on site that's another important rule for safe rigging and make sure you spotter means oh, yeah. yeah spotter mean the signal man you know flag man you mean yeah you know the signal man okay. yeah exactly so yeah, sure okay store your equipment safely this is another uh sensitive challenge i would say to make sure you know the equipment is safely stored nothing will go wrong and on the other side overall environment especially uh, the barrication you know uh, out of these yeah. five rules before that make sure the area is fully barricaded and no unauthorized person can enter or so plenty of like long theories i told you know long theories are there but at least these five uh, safety rules must be bear in our mind for safe rigging rest of the things are you know safety officer will be involved a uh, lot of other officials are there so they'll be supporting for sure but you as a rigger at least make sure these five safe rigging rules now uh it's not mandatory but uh, i have uh, one pre course assessment what i going to do is i'll share with you one question with uh, a few multiple options so let me just uh, get some idea about your answers either you give i'm not expecting 100% right answers because uh, i didn't train you <laughs> until now but still it's a pre course assessment just to understand either you have some basic uh, Uh, knowledge about rig rigging and lifting process or so that will give me some idea how deeper i have to take this course okay 
like the number one question is what type of lift line must be used when working near energized electrical equipment so some of the answers you can give by using your common sense even so the options are wire rope non conductive fiber rope metal chain or leather what is your answer it will be non conductive fiber rope excellent mashallah absolutely right brilliant mashallah no another question what do the letter swl lifting and rigging equipment mean it will be safe it will be option b safe working demand excellent mashallah so swl safe working limit or kind of load is very much important to understand and most importantly this uh, how to calculate swl that is another skill you know especially the rigor level 1 and 2 must have you know like rigor level 3 since you will be approved to lift up to 10 tons so it's not expected that you must be familiar with all the rigging formulas or everything you know because It's it's a deep technical knowledge which uh, rigor level one and two mm. must be, but rigor level three is just kind of a first stage or a first level. So later on you move on for two, move on for three. So within three years you will be the qualified rigor level one. Like if you don't have engineering degree, but if you have engineering degree, then even you can go uh, directly for rigor level one. It's up to your knowledge level or your some practical sense like i noted already mashallah that your understanding is brilliant mashallah yeah, thank you now a hard hat safely hat should have a space between the webbing and the shell of at least how much distance should be there you know a hard hat safety hat okay. should have a have space, a space between the webbing and the shell of at least how much distance them should be like 2 inches 1 and 1/2 or half inch or 3 inches or 1 inch because we require some safe distance we don't want that hard to be uh, you know uh, have some any sort of uh, friction with any element there okay this uh, space between uh, webbing means yeah webbing you know webbing. is kind of like we have webbing skill uh, sling sorry or so there are webbings being used you know for lifting any kind of load to tie up them and then we going to lift them so from that webbing uh -huh. how far yeah. what should be the distance between this webbing and the hard head i would say 3 inch because it is the maximum to keep the safe okay so better so option is 1 inch minimum okay again i mentioned a uh, minimum requirement is 1 inch okay thank you maximum of course uh, is up to now what is the most important item of safety equipment used by a rigger what is the most important item of safety equipment used by a rigger like a safety hat or sport shoes or coverall or crane the most important in the by the rigger or uh, lifter uh, the rigger what is the most important item of safety equipment used by a rigger by the rigger overall option c uh okay or the, or the crane okay so safety hat also sport shoes also okay but most important is safety hat because uh, uh, mostly you know the hand, head injury chances are very much there so safety hat is uh, critically important because he is asking the most important item so no compromise with safety hat right now when lifting any object the correct method is to use 
only the arm, one hand, the back or the leg muscles. When lifting any object, like you are lifting some slings or some shackles or some chain slings or something like that. One hand. Okay, so when lifting any object, the correct method is to use one hand. Okay, no problem. Uh, normally what we do is, it's kind of for like a manual handling, you know, whenever we lift any object, yeah. First of all, we have to use our leg muscles, not to bend our backbone, not to like uh, using one hand only. First of all, it's a game of, because object is, uh, uh, it wouldn't be like more than 25 kg, but the real challenge is uh, to put the load mostly on our leg muscles instead of uh, bending our backbone or uh, putting more uh, stress on our shoulders or arms because it can still have some muscle cramp or some other issues. So that's why the first important phenomena is to use leg muscles. Excellent, no problem. Before any lifting operation is carried out, the rigor must inform Before the subject or clean the load to be lifted or erect a large sign or barricade the area. Before any lifting operation is carried out, the rigger must. Barricade the area. Excellent, Masha. Excellent. Now, number seven, whenever possible, any rigging operation should follow the rule of keeping load. Low and slow, fast and high, above head height or slow and deep. Whenever possible, any rigging operation should follow the rule of keeping low. Uh, option A is low and slow. Excellent, Mashan. Excellent. So basically, safety is a common sense. But the terrible part is something surely would happen badly if you don't use this common sense. So it's not like mm -hmm. always the bookish knowledge or kind of so the safety, you know, even if you ask what can go wrong. If you ask that particular question to your brain, our human brain have that uh, uh, capacity, you know, to give some positive options or kind of uh, uh, understanding, you know, what can go wrong and what could be the reasons. And just we need to avoid these reasons and the process would be safely executed, you know. Yeah, exactly. Now, tagline must be used on lifts, like high or long or heavy. Taglines. Taglines means, you know, we don't want our load to be wobbling up or swinging here and there. This is option, option B, all. All, excellent, Masha. So all the time we have to use. When a load is being lifted, the rigor must. When a load is being lifted, the rigor must. Stand directly beneath the load or sit under the crane driver's cabin or stand clear of the load or sit on the top of the load? Option C, stand clear of the, of the load. Excellent, Mashallah. Brilliant. Okay, number 10, the last question. Refer to picture. Look at this picture. Yes. What is the name of the equipment show below? Is it like turnbuckle or eye bolt or wire rope clip or bow shackle? It's like a D-shackle, but uh, it is not mentioning the option. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, D-shackle is uh, purely D, actually. Yeah, it is purely D, right. So it could be bow. Yeah, it's bow shackle, actually. Bow shackle, right. Okay. Excellent, Brilliant. So, Mr. Fazan, uh, I'm truly happy that you have uh, very much clear understanding. So I hope... Uh, it will give you a quite better approach, you know, to uh, move on, inshallah, with your qualification and passing all the exam, wherever any type of exam will be there. So, but still, I'll go through with some deep knowledge and let's try to learn from each other. And this is how we can facilitate because no one is perfect.
so at least we can try to understand you know how things can be beneficial as a professional you know in rigging and lifting processes so uh, the course overview is quite straightforward uh, you must be capable because i'm going to teach especially the pre use inspection of uh, rigging gears like slings and below the hook lifting devices and rejection criteria also especially how to recognize and the damage gear and removing it from the service this is the challenge actually so before it creates an unsafe condition so personal learn how to perform periodic inspections also that would also be our uh, deep point to understand through this training and how to right. accumulate the minor issues which can result in unsafe equipment so that is kind of a overview of uh, this course so that's why i chop up this uh, process in three stages like before during and after so before starting rigging just utilizing our common sense mr fazan what do you think what steps we must follow you know, before starting the rigging process before starting the rigging process uh, the main equipment we use while the rigging is uh, the crane so the place where we are going to place or install the crane that place should be solid you know it must be leveled and uh, the surface should be compressed so after that crane will be installed and uh, the uh, the crane operator should be uh, authorized and uh, while we are lifting uh, the the belts we are using should be tested either they, they can lift the either they have the capacity to lift the, the specific load that we are we are that we are going to lift and the dish shackles and the load hooks where we are going to uh, insert the we will if where from we are going to hook the load are okay so these are the things Hello. Hello. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Fazan, my voice is clear. Yeah, I can hear you now. Ah, okay, sir. So, uh, what I mean is, Mashallah, you elaborated all the important elements. So let's try to make it a little bit more uh, systematic. Like, you know, uh, the first important part is to make sure we have a work permit system. for this rigging and lifting process is there any permit we need to get and if that permit yes. is important if that permit is mandatory to gain this permit what requirements we have to fulfill do we need to do joint site inspection of that area where we are going to lift or going to execute our process or project are we going to prepare any jsa or how we going to fill this work permit form and 
who will be the signatory and the most important part is uh, uh, do we really need actually a specific uh, verification if the if the job is in a restricted area which is quite sensitive and prohibited and do we need some special permissions you know along with our permit system sometimes maybe uh, only five uh, ton load is there but that lifting is going to be happening in uh, prohibited or restricted areas so do we need a rigor level one or still third uh, rigor level three will be uh, okay for us actually i hope you got the point so overall we will mm -hmm. understand the key requirements of that particular area or the condition or even the site mm -hmm. Do we require HIP, like hazard identification plan, especially if we are doing this project for Saudi Aramco? Do we need ERP, like emergency response plan, especially if lifting is going on near to confined spaces or, you know, again, some restricted areas? Yeah, exactly. Now, who will be the, or how many team members we required and uh, how are I going to make sure they are qualified one, especially the crane operator, the signal man, the safety officer, the project manager, or even the rigor level three, two, or one, whosoever is according to the need is needed, you know. So shall I get their CVs? Shall I verify their IDs, their certifications? Yeah, exactly. So once I done all these things, and now I got complete uh, permission from the client to go ahead with the project. So then uh, what level of barrication I required? And what should be the height of that barrication? What should be the strength of that barrication? <laughs> Plenty of technical points inside. And how I gonna make sure right. that no irrelevant or, you know, unauthorized person is uh, going into my area actually while we are executing the project so how many other team members are required so you you come you just complete the complete before package you know whatever is required whatever the requirement is there before starting the project you try to complete them as per your customer requirements as per legal international local or legal international standards you fulfill all the might be OSHA requirements are there, might be you're following some uh, Madon or maybe some uh, Sasso requirements, maybe some Royal Commission as per the nature of your project or the area you are. So once all things are done for before for this process, then move on during actually. And before means also the toolbox meeting. Right. And toolbox meeting, what things matters a lot, you will definitely discuss with them and you'll give some motivation not to do anything or not to perform any unsafe act or report any unsafe condition or any abnormalities because no compromise on safety actually. Now, during, the, during that process, what things matters a lot? Are we going to use a tagline? Are we going to uh, ensure that the spot man or the signal man and the crane operator both have a clear understanding about the signals? And the crane operator understand, you know, or they have the similar language. Sometimes maybe the sing signal man signal is entirely different and crane operator understand entirely different signal. I hope you got the point. Right. And during this lifting, how are we gonna make sure that the wind speed or any other factors or overhead power lines or, I mean, nothing will go wrong, God forbid, and your supervision or any safety officer or you as a regular level three, how are you gonna monitor that nothing will go wrong? Or if any abnormality is there, you can stop the job and you know guide them again. Yeah. Now, if uh, that uh, job is, uh, near to confined spaces or kind of exhibited areas deeper than uh, four feet. So it's a confined space, right? Yeah. Now, any toxic gases, are you required some gas testing or be, even though you are not going inside, but still something is coming outside, are you going to have some gas testing, con uh, continuous gas monitoring of that area? Or you will just assume 
that nothing will go wrong actually no exactly we will have, we will have to have to test the toxic gases excellent much okay. no in my area mr fezan in my area how i going to make sure that no one nobody affected with covid is coming to my area or the persons who are working within my area there isn't any chance of infection you know to so how i will make sure that during the job they are not uh, handshaking they are not having kind of horse play or i hope you got the point so yeah, exactly. overall overall 360 degree we evaluate we uh, plan each step and we try to implement you know because ultimately our biggest goal is zero accident and meeting uh, our customer satisfaction you know and also meeting the deadlines because we don't want to delay that project yeah it's not to compromise on quality or productivity also of that project because ultimately there are penalty clauses also signed with saudi aramco or with our customer right now once the job is done safely how we are going to close or how we are going to give back site to our customer you know so are we going to have head count how are we going to remove all the materials all our equipments uh, what things we need to sign in terms of documentation how are we going to close up this permit and make sure the project is 100% uh, closed and nothing is left behind housekeeping is well done yeah, exactly. so that means any process three different stages before during and after now if something you miss important especially within before that means your input is insufficient or your input is wrong or your input is not complete in other way around the output surely will have some bad consequences you know exactly because our process execution will be affected and which ultimately bring some terrible outcome which would never be liked by our customer or even our management because ultimately we all are business means to making profit right right but not by killing people not by damaging the property or not by damaging the environment as well right so that's why we have to be careful in all three stages like before during and after no so let's discuss in nutshell what are the key responsibilities of uh, rigor level 1 rigor so, level 3 right huh? yeah oh, sorry rigor level 3 yeah right okay. so that means inspecting and you know mostly i deliver trainings for rigor level 1 because everyone is having a straight forward dream to be the rigor level 1 so right. so that's why you know but anyhow okay. this inspecting and preparing loads that need to be moved setting aligning and leveling have you given machinery like you mentioned selecting the appropriate rigging gears and also preparing rigging equipment like including kind of beams pulleys whatever is required you know according to the nature of the project it's not like always the crane is involved sometimes you have overhead crane there are different types of cranes you know so I inspecting know. rigging before final use and monitoring and maintaining rigging equipment and also maneuvering loads using heavy equipment machinery and by hand and the most important part is ensuring compliance that there isn't any kind of violation against company safety procedures and also make sure the communication like communicating with the rigging and construction team or whoever is involved for that project there is a communication now how is rigging load calculated i mean yeah this is the most important yeah so one way round we we you know if i purchase something mr fizan let's take an example i purchase one machine from usa and now my manufacturer or my supplier he is responsible to give me all the details about that particular load actually whatever i purchase either is a machine either is a crane or any sort of you know material could be there but it's a load it's a heavy load actually 
Right. So now my supplier is responsible to tell me what is the size of that load, what is you know the nature of that load. Is it a round? Is it a horizontal shape or vertical shape or you know conical shape? Whatever. And most important thing, what is the weight of that load? Right. And this load, even if we double check by calculating through some uh, formulas. It should be correct, actually. That means we don't want any wrong reporting from our manufacturer or supplier because accordingly, we are going to use our frame capacity unit. Sure. So this load at the bill of lading should not be reported incorrectly, one thing. Secondly, according to the load, the crane capacity must be like 25% or even sometime uh, people believe the crane capacity should be even 50% more than the load. Even. That's what they believe because they right. want to play with the, you know, and sometimes people ignore. I hope you have some idea about shelf life of the crane or shelf life of your or the lifting gears actually. Shelf life means kind of an expiry date. Right. If I purchase one crane, maybe five years before okay. and that crane can lift 200 tons right. but after five years it's not the same actually yeah exactly so every day every year the crane is uh, depreciating in the accounts books as well as through the third party inspection teams we are calculating the existing capacity also or the current loading capacity or lifting capacity of our crane. That is why the third party inspection is very much important. It's not like only putting a tag or sticker, you know. Yeah, okay. Because uh, again, uh, why I'm telling only putting the tag or sticker because I noted a few of the third party inspection companies and they just uh, change the tag or change the, just, you know, this, uh, sticker but yeah. unfortunately later on accident happened because of overloading yeah, exactly and now to who we have to blame you know because if something is written by authorized third party inspectors so how come we can you know uh, challenge their figures actually but now uh, we have full right if uh, something is being done by the third party, no harm to double check. Use another third party. Like, let me give you an example of Saudi Aramco. Like they purchase one lot from Lulu market for paper cups. Okay. Mm -hmm. They purchase paper cup and uh, they sent, even though they got migration reporting and plenty of other laboratory reports from the Lulu because he got from the manufacturer. But still, I noted, so because I was in the training session, uh, delivering some trainings to the quality and HR and some safety department directly of Saudi Aramco. So they told me, yeah, even we double check and cross check and we send these cups to Singapore just to yeah. cross check that our supplier is not playing with us. Because it's a high hygienic product. Our Ramconians, like our employees, they are going to drink coffee or you know, some hot liquor. So we don't want any kind of uh, food poisoning or any issues actually. Right. So same way, no harm to double check that our third party inspection companies, they are doing their job honestly. So no harm to cross check them, you know. Yeah, exactly. And ultimately, if our supplier is giving us the bill of letting and telling, oh, this is the load of the machine, then no harm to understand the formula which I'm going to share now. How we can calculate and cross check that the machine or the load, what is claimed by the supplier is exactly the same actually. Okay. And for this load calculation, one method is quite straightforward. That is like, uh, you know, sling angle factor chart must be there. That means the ratio of the length of the sling divided by the height. Quite straightforward. 
the length of the sling divided by the height. So what you're going to get is the sling leg load of two vertical slings is one half of the total load. Like if you have total load like 1,000 pounds divided by two, so two slings vertical have five, 500 on each actually. Each sling, 500 pounds because two slings are there. So that is a formula, the sling like angle factor, the ratio of the length of the sling divided by the height. So divided by two, that means uh, 1,000 divided by two is equal to 500 pounds for each sling. Now let's understand more deeper. Suppose we use uh, crane capacity, material weight, hook block weight and load chart. Okay. And this is a kind of an example of load chart. And normally right. this load chart, uh, I noted at the Ramco sites, Sometimes it's really hard to read because ink is faded. It's a very dirty paper, not even sometimes laminated with plastic. File is dirty because of a lot of dust storms and you know so many things happening there. Yeah. So and people started relying on what? On their brainy strengths. They don't want to communicate again and again with the chart, you know. What they believe is. No, we are fully experienced. So we don't want to see again and again the load chart. While you must be, you know, is, uh, habitually trained every time, go back and double check as per the angle, what should be the load? You know, the no harm to verify the boom length in meters and the angle in degree and also the maximum load width, actually. You can verify and double check from the load chart. Ultimately, okay. Ultimately, the things important are the crane capacity, the material weight itself, the hook block weight and load chart and boom length and crane radius. So if these uh, uh, all informations are with us, like we know the crane capacity, we know the material weight. So let's try to understand the formula directly. So how are we going to calculate the crane capacity? Like uh, we must be familiar. What is the boom length? Let's take an example of uh, 28 meters. The crane capacity is 65 tons. That figure, because everything is written actually on the crane, you know, there are some steel tags or kind of steel plates, you know, if you clean them up, you don't need to understand, uh, read the documentation. You just uh, see something on the crane itself. So all things are written there. Like crane capacity is 65 tons or check the third party inspection tag, you know, Okay. Now, the SWL, like 15.5 tons by using load chart, we can easily familiar because we have two figures like crane capacity is there, boom length is there. So ultimately, from the load chart, we will see oh, the safe working load is 15.5 tons. Right. Now, if the hook block is 4 ton, the material weight is 8 ton. So what would be the crane radius? eight meters. So we have all these information. Now we will put in the formula because since we have all the figures. So what we're going to do is what is the formula which uh, purely we have to remember crane percentage capacity is equal to hook block plus material weight divided by SWL multiplied by 100. So we will get in right. percentage what is the crane capacity or the lifting capacity, you know. Exactly. Take the hook block plus material weight divided by SWL multiply with 100. And now if we see the figure, the hook block is 4 tons and material weight is 8 tons. Yes. And divided by SWL is 15.5 tons. Then we got it from the load chart, uh, Mr. Fazan. Right. That means the load chart is critical here. Otherwise, we okay. have only one option to rely on the supplier's information. You know. Now multiply with hundred, and uh, if you if you exactly calculate, so seventy seven point four one percent. This is the way how you can calculate. So I need your WhatsApp number. So what I'm gonna do is I'll share this presentation with you. You know. Okay. So you can refresh your knowledge whenever you get time. 
even though uh, you have some sound practical understanding, but still, you know, in Aramco, you have two exams, one practical, the second one is practical. So practical, I will yes. share with you a lot of uh, questions, like with multiple options to clear your theoretical exam and uh, some better understanding about the practical exam also. Right. Okay, this says WL. Yes. This we will get only from the from the load chart. No, no, no. We can calculate same like like if we can calculate crane capacity, so we can calculate SWL also. So uh, you mentioned before that the crane capacity is uh, is uh, is normally mentioned on the crane document or on the crane on some. Uh, even some other like you get a bill of lading, you get some, you know, this uh, book is the operating manual of the crane. Plenty right. of documentation related to crane, you will get all information there. Okay, what are the what are the values that, that we can get easily from the crane? Like, like we can get this uh, crane capacity, boom length. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite uh, you know. There, there are some there are some cranes which which has a, this capacity to re, to reduce and increase the boom size. Absolutely right, absolutely right. And now now there is uh, this artificial intelligence is also incorporated in. So you can get the reading. Oh. You increase the boom and the load. That means more boom you are opening, less the load would be tackled up. Yes, exactly. So if you are opening up the, because so that, uh, calculate it, uh, what is the size area? would also be increased, you know. Radius also, radius will also increase, yes. Yeah, exactly. Because boom, you are opening more and more. So less would be the yeah. weight, you know. You can't go with the same weight. That's why the boom length and the crane capacity accordingly you have to calculate. Because 28 meter boom you are opening. Even though okay. the crane capacity is 65 tons, but still the SWL is 15.5 tons. That yes, right. Hardly 25%. Actually, or maybe my question is, actually, I want to, I just want to know that uh, the, the cranes who are capable of, uh, of increasing or decreasing the boom. So for how can we calculate, we can check that what is the exact length of the boom right now? No, this is, you know, if you see on the different cranes now, there is a kind of uh, uh, meters available and you can read and write numbers, you know. The more you are right. boom opening, they are showing some readings. The system right. is there now. If that system is not there, that crane is absolute actually. The crane is not pasta. Yeah, because this crane, you know, you are using the oldest version actually. Right, exactly right. And now uh, I, I see some of the cranes, they are operating by sitting in uh, Germany. And the load mm. they are tackling here in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, you can say because technology is increasing day exactly. by day. <laughs> exactly, my friend. Now, on the other side, uh, determine the volume of the load because sometimes we don't get uh, the load information from the bill of lading, from sometimes the sticker is not there. Right. Nothing is mentioned by the supplier and or maybe on the on the road actually while transporting, some of the informations are faded up and nothing is written there. So now how are we gonna determine? Because there isn't any excuse, you know. You can't give that excuse, right. oh, I don't know the load. So that's why everything is miscalculated. Yeah, exactly. If you don't know the load, then know the formula how to calculate the load. Right. Like the determine the volume of the load and material is composed of uh, load weight is equal to weight per volume and multiply total volume. That means the load weight is equal to weight per volume multiply total volume. So let's take an example. Material weight is 100 pounds per cubic foot. So what are you going to do is 
hundred multiply hundred is equal to ten thousand pounds actually. Right. Now let's talk about an important element of the hooks because uh, without hooks, you know, all other lifting gears have zero value sometimes. Right. <laughs> So bear in mind, hooks are one of the most uh, used type of rigging hardware. They are made in many different sizes and shapes to meet a wide range of application. They can be attached to the load blocks, slings, or other lifting devices, such as lifting beams. Preferably hooks should be embossed with the size rate at least. You know. So we have shank hook, we have clevis hook, and we also have another eye hook. Right. We also have choker hook, we have Sherlock hook, we have barrel hook, sorting hook. And uh, remember, Mr. Fazan, nobody can remember all these things. That is why I'm okay. telling you, give me your WhatsApp number, I will share this presentation. So whenever sure. you get time, just keep refreshing your knowledge. Yeah, thank you. It's a regular you do it. Now, when using two slings, when using two slings, look at the picture, you know. Yeah. Because application is also critical, how to apply, how to use these hooks. So when using two slings, place in a hook can show that the including angle between the slings is not greater than 90 degree. Right. Because more than 90 degree means the more chances of- uh, Exactly, unsafe. Right. And same way, if the angle is below 30 degree, again, unsafe. Should be more than 30 and less than 90, huh? less than 90 or 90. But trust me, right. we have horrible practices on floor. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody cares what is 30, what is 90. Everybody cares how to, you know, take shortcuts and just damn care about safety rules. Let's finish yes. this job as quick as possible and show our heroism to our supervisor or manager, you know. Yeah, exactly. That is but that heroism <laughs> is killing people, killing our employees, and they don't get yeah. second yeah. chance, by the way. Yeah. Now look at this uh, hook types, correct use and inspection when hooks are used on the end. Now, if you increase uh, you know, if that angle if that angle is below 30 degree, that means the more stress will come here. So more chances of uh, uh, clinking or more chances of breakage as well. You know. Right. And also uh, load will be like, uh, if, if chains are or slings are broken, that means the load is going to be fall down. And that is the yeah. reason sometimes people again don't get check the second chance. Like if it is uh, uh, five ton or 10 tons, or sometimes even more than 40 tons. And sometimes people have a tendency to stand under suspended load. And one guy I noted even smoking, you know, <laughs> under the load. <laughs> and even the sun beams were there. So he, he considers like a shady area. So this is kind of a common sense. You know, that day I realized, yes, safety is a common sense, but what if you don't use yeah, your yeah. common sense? That is more terrible. Yes, everybody have common sense, but people have tendency even to ignore and don't use common sense, you know. That is why still more accidents are happening. Like this is wrong. Yeah. And see some inspection parameters, make sure, first of all, no crack is acceptable anywhere. No wear and tear or crack is acceptable yeah, exactly. for any deformation, any deshaping or, or the hook angle, this angle, if it is more than like 10% uh, or so, that means this hook is also, or even this, uh, a uh, safety clip is not there, still it's not uh, usable, right? Right. So your yes or your no? 
again straight forward yes sir straight forward no must be there no compromise right i hope uh, one picture is more louder than 1000 words i mean you can see why it is mentioned no yeah, exactly exactly i can so no see. harm to no harm to learn about asme standards like some of the international standards how what kind of materials or you know even that material is it acceptable to saudi aramco or sometime you know people they don't understand aramco standards so they'll be stuck because sometimes they hire ordinary you know third party crane operation companies and they have no idea what are amco standards are there exactly so there must be some load test especially for hook inspection as i mentioned earlier like 15% maximum throat opening but 10% maximum allowable wear so increase in throat opening 15 so i still mention 10% because above then 10 means is is danger zone started so immediately it will go directly accelerate even maybe more than 15 sometime you know right so that's why right after 10 consider it's a danger zone and double check and make sure you know nothing will go wrong because ultimately the whole load is uh, uh, occupied with the hook actually hook and um, yeah so same way if you are using eye bolts you must be familiar how to inspect them any wear and tear or any eye distortion or thread damage or shank distortion is not acceptable actually and especially the heat damage also and right. if uh, this any sort of uh, lifting gear if you can't find capacity marking don't accept that one okay yep. Because it is always 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 mentioned on the right. It is always mentioned on the bolts, right? Yeah, exactly. Because it is embossed, you know, like from the manufacturer. From the manufacturer, yes, right. Yeah. Same with the shackles. First of all, on the shackles, uh, marking uh, must be verified, especially like who is the manufacturer. Okay. If designated angles of two legs, like forty-five degrees, or SWL working load limit, must be like this is like forty-three tons or four tons or whatever the diameter of the body. Right. So, uh, Mr. Fezan, no harm to have someone as an internal inspector for lifting gears instead of always relying on third-party inspectors. Okay. So I'm encouraging to the market instead of relying on third party, first improve your internal controls, you know. Sure. Because to sure. be very honest, your subcontractors, your contractors, mostly they are the money makers. They just need the paycheck ultimately. You know. Indeed, is it the case? Yes. Yeah. So, but your internal, your internal effective controls would be a great foundation of your safety of your properties of your business of your employees even to the environment i would say okay so this is kind of like application make sure you know you are using in the right way when the use hook is small some packing is required to stabilize the shackle this is the correct way right and this is incorrect Again, I would say one picture is more louder than thousand words. Right. Since I'll share this presentation, I hope you will keep continued because it's a, it's a good start of learning instead of uh, because in one day how come how much we can remember. Yeah. <laughs> so this is another way like correct and incorrect. We need safety pins for sure. Right. Same way the webbing slings, uh, if you are using polyester, while it is not uh, recommended and acceptable to some of the uh, Ramco projects, even mostly, you know, they, they don't want to accept polyester actually because a lot of heat is there, but still just to highlight some color combination, 
what is the meaning of colors like if you see here in that means 10 tons blue means 8 tons red means 5 tons gray means 4 tons yellow means 3 tons green means 2 ton and violet means 1 ton so through the color also yeah. we can easily understand what is the tonnage uh, recommended exactly. tonnage of that particular sling the other slings, we have different types. Uh, look at the types. Six types are there. Type 1, type 2, 3, 4, and 5, 6. But the key point is uh, web slings, uh, no doubt, is available in two materials, nylon and polyester. Nylon is resistant to many alkalis, like whereas polyester is resistant to many acids. Consult the manufacturer before using web slings and chemical environment. So now again, it depends on our environment, where we are going to use them. Nylon slings are common, but polyester slings are often recommended where headroom is limited since the stretch only half is half much as nylon slings. So choker end slings, and we have triangle end fitting. That means the end lengths or grommet slings, or we have metal end fittings actually. So according to our need, we have to select the right set of slings. That is why you will see, might be within your company also, you will see kind of some checklist. Okay, I'm going to lift uh, 20 tons or 10 tons or 5 tons. Oh, these are the uh, things I need to use. And you just tick mark. Each number is there. And accordingly, you select and you tick mark because color coding and everything is standardized. All the labels are there also. Okay. Now, these are some of the examples of wire rope deteriorations. That means uh, these are not acceptable, any kind of uh, damage. Wire rope, yes. But still on floor, we will find horrible bad practices. In. Like a lot of yeah. wires are shredded up, still they are using, still they are lifting. Just what they want is nobody is watching them. Right, exactly. If someone is watching them, of course, you know, even sometimes they will delay the project because someone is watching. Right. The moment he went back to his office, they'll start again. Very clever, you know. Ultimately, they just want to finish the project. Right. So these exactly. are the 16 different wire of uh, quality issues which we have to bear in mind. Right. Now let's understand the types of uh, chain slings. We have different types of chain slings like single leg, endless, double leg. And even with clutches, double basket sling, we have three leg. How are we gonna use them? Or how are we gonna remove them? As I told you, any type of cracks or breaks or wear and tear is not acceptable or any stretch uh -huh. things or bent, twisted, or evidence of heat damage or excessive fitting or even Croyan, I would say, because uh, we are, we are you know, occupied, especially in oil and gas, with certain kind of chemicals. And they are uh, a killing element for the metals as well. So they create rust, they create Croyan. So in that sense, uh, of course, the shelf life would also be affected. The quality of uh, the chain thing would be a big question mark. So that means no wear and tear or twister or bend chains are acceptable. We need complete straight or well visible quality inspection must be there. Now hand signals, uh, uh, you can see some videos also because uh, right now uh, if I'll show videos, it will like maybe some uh, internet connect connectivity issues will be there. So what I recommend is you can go to YouTube and find out some hand signal videos if uh, you are unable to understand these stuff because stop, how to stop and dog everything and hoist up slowly, hoist up, hoist down, use main hoist. Same way, use uh, white line auxiliary hoist or raise boom, lower boom, swing, or raise the boom and the load, the load, or lower the boom and the raise the load. 
travel or extend boom or retract boom or travel crawler crane both tracks now you can double check what kind of signals your crane operator and signal man are using <laughs> Is it similar to the standard or they have their own uh, sign of communication? Right. Okay, so this is uh, all about, but few of the questions I would uh, recommend if you can uh, participate, please. Uh, like look at the picture now. Yeah, this is the picture, what is the name of the equipment show below? Is it shackle or turnbuckle or D-shackle or eyeball? It is D-shackle. D-shackle. Now, a shackle is used to what? Like make an eye in the load or support a load or join two separate loads or connect a sling to a load. A shackle is used for what? Shackle is used to... Of course, it's a connection, right? Yeah, connection. Connect it is connected to sling to load. Yeah. Option D is. Exactly. So if the threads on the pin of a shackle are damaged, you must what? Rethread the pin okay. or weld the pin into position or only use it for light loads or destroy the shackle. Uh, do you destroy the shackle and you should it, use no a new one? But you will see a lot of shackles and they don't want to destroy it. Yeah, exactly. They are saving the money. <laughs> yeah, saving the money, but killing the people, right? Killing the people. Because probability will go up. The incident accident probability will go up. The more you compromise with safety and uh, the terrible thing what they don't remember that how come you can be lucky forever? Exactly. All your shortcuts, one day, anytime you have to pay back, you know, with terrible right. consequences. So a shackle has no SWL stamp. You must what? If a shackle you found with uh, no SWL stamp, what should you do? Not use it. Huh? Excellent machine. No, refer to graphic. What is the name of the sling sound? Endless bolt. Endless, endless wire bolt. rope. Yes, endless wire rope. Excellent. Okay, so refer to graphic. What is the name of the sling down? Same like we have uh, endless, uh, you know, this wire rope. Same way we have endless belt. Endless belt, yeah. Okay, Mr. Fazan, uh, thank you very much.